Just keep matriculating the ball down the field, boys. When the 1972 Miami Dolphins returned home from Super Bowl VII, they received a hero's welcome. Thousands turned out to cheer head coach Don Shula, owner Joe Robbie, and the newly crowned champions of professional football. This is the Vince Lombardi Trophy for the winner of the Super Bowl. 17-0 says it all. The World Championship... in professional football. The players are, are very happy for this world championship, but you, the fans, should be just as deserving for the support you've given us the last three years. Thank you. I remember going on parades after the perfect season in Tampa and Jacksonville and Orlando, all the places because Florida, this entire state of Florida, we're all Dolphin fans. How far did you all come to get here? Carl Gables. <laughs> no! The Dolphins were the first Florida franchise to win a world championship. And throughout the state, fans of all ages were singing their praises. Miami Dolphins, Miami Dolphins, Miami Dolphins number one. This outpouring of affection was a new experience for the Miami players. Three years earlier, pro football in general, and the Dolphins in particular, were like fish out of water in South Florida. We had some games where there were only 15, 17, 19,000 people in the stands. And that's not very many people when you look at uh, the 80,000 that the Orange Bowl could see. How many tickets have you got there? Six. Are you trying to sell them? Well, I could sell them, but nobody wants them. There's so many tickets. Everyone's trying to sell them. I'll just give them away. Get a ticket for one dollar. The number of the Dolphin players were hired by the team to take the highlight film around to all the service clubs in town just to sell season tickets. So uh, you'd end up meeting a lot of people because you were out trying to sell tickets to a football team, and they'd say, who are you? Who do you play for? But once at 72, Super Bowl happened. That kind of atmosphere changed. I think what uh, Joe Robbie and Don Shula have done uh, for this area can't be measured. It's put us on the map, uh, and I'm, I'm sure that they're going to keep us on the map for many years to come. Dolphin fever was everywhere. In 1972, the Dolphins made NFL history by completing an entire season unbeaten and untied. <laughs> they were America's new glamour team, and life was good. Every team after a Super Bowl, particularly the winner, is involved in a great deal of publicity and uh, promotional work. Today, a girl can share a lot of things with a guy. Here's one, Vitalis Dry Control, a man's hairspray. Nice game, Bob. In pro football, the glow of victory can be a dangerous thing. It can make a hungry team complacent. 
it can make a focus team distracted. Don Shula would not let that happen to the Dolphins in 1973. He set the pace from the start of training camp, driving the players through long workouts under the scorching Florida sun. Shula would not let us lose. He was just a miserable SOB when you lost. I don't think that anything good ever comes out of losing. That's my attitude. That's the attitude of our football team. And you wouldn't say a word to him. You wouldn't joke. You'd keep your mouth shut and you'd grind. Shake it loose. Big mistake. Let's go. Don Shula went berserk on the sidelines and would call us everything that uh, you can imagine. He will hunt you down and tell you, make the frickin' play. Hey, play! Play! Get in there! Let's go! The only way to escape that kind of wrath was to be perfect. The Dolphins were perfect in 1972, but Shula felt they could be just as good in 1973. All 22 starters were returning with a clear sense of purpose. Mercury, Mars. Determination would be the key factor in the word that I would use with regard to our 72 team. And confidence and preparedness would be the phrase that I would use in 1973. Because our execution was that good, our players were that good, and we were that good, and we knew that. And here's what we're going to do, this handful of things. If you can stop it, stop it. But here we come. It wasn't fancy. It was just excellent. Defensive end Michael Strahan and his agent met with Giants GM Jerry Reese on Thursday to discuss his future. Strahan has two years left on his contract and is scheduled to make $4 million this season. Meanwhile, the Steelers announced on Thursday that they released veteran Joey Porter. The outside linebacker was with the Steelers for eight seasons. Porter was a three-time Pro Bowler. In New Orleans, Joe Horn was released on Thursday. The Saints All-Pro wideout wants to explore his current market value within the NFL. New Orleans remains hopeful that Horn may return to the team. Other notable cuts on Thursday include Cowboys quarterback Drew Bledsoe, Chargers wide receiver Keenan McCardell, and Colts wide receiver Brandon Stokely. Players who re-signed on Thursday include Jags running back Fred Taylor, Staying on the ground, Mike Allstott stays put in Tampa. And Adam Schefter reports Sean O'Hara of re-ups for the Giants for five years for 19 million bucks. This is NFL Network Now. Chemistry is an integral part of any team effort. The chemistry of that team it's a byproduct of the coaching. And uh, pick the one that I think has the best chance of helping us. You know, for Don you. Shula wouldn't keep players around very long that were going to take away from the total team effort. It truly was a big team, little me, and if it was all about big me, you didn't last with Don Shula. Most of the Dolphins understood and accepted Shula's team concept. Eugene Mercury Morris did not. Morris set the all-time NCAA rushing record at West Texas State, so he came to Miami with a big-time reputation and an ego to match. Eugene, for a while, he didn't have his head on exactly uh, straight. And we were on the team bus going from the hotel to the stadium. Mercury gets on with his ghetto blaster, just loud as can be and very distracting. And the last thing I was going to let happen would be to have Mercury invade my mental space with some jive bullshit. So that box was going out the window, and it did. <laughs> That's untrue. Totally untrue? Please. Do I seem like a guy that would allow somebody to throw my music box out and not do anything? Please. He knew he was in the wrong. There wasn't much he could do about it. I mean, he's a little guy anyway. People like to have those fables because they're so far from the truth. I played my music, although I'll tell you, in our locker room, it was a, a battle between uh, 
the country western from uh, Howard Twilley and um, Power Jam 99 by me. Uh, he turned on the, the country western, I'd go back and turn on the Power Jam. You know, it was the black station. He'd go back and turn it on, I'd go back and turn the other one on. Until finally, we listened to Power 99. In 1971, Larry Zonka, number 39, and Jim Kick, number 21, played ahead of Morris in the Miami backfield. Zonka and Kick ran together off the field as well. They were so inseparable, they became known as Butch and Sundance, and they played those roles to the hilt. Zonka and Kick helped carry the Dolphins to their first AFC championship, but in Super Bowl VI, Butch and Sundance were no match for the Dallas Cowboys. Mercury Morris never touched the ball from scrimmage, and after the game, his frustration boiled over. The reporter came up to me and he said, uh, uh, Mercury, is there, is there something wrong? And I'm thinking, what is this guy talking about? Is there something wrong? Uh, I said, yeah, something's wrong. I didn't play in this game. And the only time I was off the bench except for the kickoffs was the national anthem. Don, at that time, did not have the kind of confidence in me as a player. And really, it was not unwarranted because I was kind of a wild kind of a kid at that particular time. And, and although I was a runner, I really hadn't fit into Don's uh, scheme of things in terms of making mistakes. You can't make any mistakes when we're with Don Shula because he has to trust you. Shula had concerns about Morris's temperament, but not his talent. Morris had the highest yards per carry average on the team in 1971, and his speed made the Miami offense more explosive. So in 1972, Shula expanded Morris's role. The other thing I'd like to find out about Merck is whether or not he's capable of starting a ball game and going the entire ball game. So we're going to let him do this in preseason and just try to measure him this way as opposed to just being a spot player, the way that I've used him quite a bit in the last couple of years. When Shula gave me that shot to play, that was going to interrupt that concept of Butch and Sundance. Larry, the game had to be full of mixed emotions for you. Your best friend, Jim Kick, uh, almost didn't get an opportunity to play. Well, Jane, this is a touchy subject at the moment. I don't want to go into it very much. Uh, it's tough for me to say anything because I'm best of friends with Jim, and of course I'm good friends with Merck, so anytime I say anything about one, it looks bad for the other. It came to a sudden shock, really, to me. You know, I've been playing for four years straight, and all of a sudden, uh, I'm not playing. And uh, I think it was unfair the way it happened. I'm not knocking Mercury, because Mercury's a tremendous football player, as he proved last year. And uh, I think I'm a good football player. It's just the way it happened, really, that uh, sort of, you know, gripes me. I was never going to beat Jim Kick out. I was striving to get an opportunity to play with Jim Kick. Do you think, uh, based on what has happened now, especially night that you have earned that starting position well, next I'm, week? I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not concerned about that 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 thing about starting. You know, I'm only interested in helping this team get back to the Super Bowl, which is our main goal. In 1972, Mars moved into the starting backfield with Zonko. They each rushed for more than 1,000 yards. The first time in NFL history that two backs on the same team reached the 1,000-yard plateau. Kick played in a third down roll and added almost 700 yards of total offense. The threesome combined for 24 touchdowns in the Dolphins' perfect season. Shula had taken a potential morale problem and turned it into a strength. Common bond. A common bond was actually Don. Shula made it so that we understood the distinction between having a football team and just playing on a football team. I got drafted in 1998, and I think the big surprise of the day for me was uh, that I got drafted. <laughs> Late in the sixth round, team started calling and got on the phone with Andy Reid, the quarterback's coach for the Green Bay Packers. Pick 187's flashing on the screen, and there went my name, and the Green Bay Packers, they had a pretty good quarterback named Brett Favre. I knew the first thing I needed to do was take down the poster of him that I had in my room, because that wasn't going to be very cool. The NFL Draft, live on NFL Network. After opening the 1973 season with a win over San Francisco, the Dolphins went to Oakland in week two. 
There, they saw their 18-game winning streak snapped by the Raiders. It was the Dolphins' first loss since Super Bowl VI. But the team that was so businesslike in victory was just as businesslike in defeat. You know, was the pressure off of us uh, that our unbeaten streak uh, was not alive? Not really, because no, I don't think we really thought much about it. Uh, other teams thought more about it than we did. We still were preparing game by game by game. For the Dolphins, the next game was the only game that mattered. They were playing the New England Patriots, and to ensure an inspired effort, linebacker Nick Bonacanti invented a story about the Patriots putting a bounty on Mercury Mars. I can see Nick walking up to me now, you know, with his Italian self. Hey, I, I'm telling you right now, I think they, uh, these guys are going to come after you today. So you better watch yourself, I'm just telling you. They might want to come after you. I mean, you know, like it's Sopranos or something, you know. And I said, hey, they're coming after me? Okay. Let them come. Mars carried the ball 15 times and set a team record with 197 rushing yards. He scored three touchdowns and celebrated each one with a thunderous spike. And it wasn't a spike, it was a bust. It was an attempt to bust the ball. And I was trying to make it bounce as high as I possibly could so that they'd have to go like this and look up at the ball, knowing full well I'm finished with it. In the 1973 season, Morris led the NFL with an average of 6.3 yards per rushing attempt. It was a devastating combination. A back with breakaway speed running behind football's best offensive line. Rick, every Sunday I'm more impressed with that offensive line. With Krugenberg opening it up and a little blasting through there. Boy, I'm telling you, what block it. Our offensive line. They were one of the greatest offensive lines, I believe, in the history of pro football. Hello, 36 George, second half. Miami's offensive linemen were known as the Expendables. All five starters were either cut or traded by another NFL team before finding a home in Miami. Left tackle Wayne Moore was waived by San Francisco. Right tackle Norm Evans was acquired in the expansion draft from Houston. Right guard Larry Little was dealt away by San Diego. Center Jim Langer was cut by Cleveland. But no one traveled a longer, harder road than left guard Bob Kuchenberg, number 67. I'd never played guard in my life until I went to Philadelphia. I got picked in the third round by the Eagles. It was a bunch of uh, older, threatened players who didn't really welcome the, the rookies. So I actually quit. Then I went to the phone booth and called my mother and she said, oh, well, Bobby, you're old enough to, to know what you're doing, uh, but here, tell your brother. No, Mom, no, no, uh, no, no, don't give him the phone. So Rudy got on. He was with the Bears, and he said, oh, you got cut, huh? Well, don't, don't get discouraged. I've been cut before. I said, well, I didn't really get cut. I, uh, I quit. Excuse me? You what? You, you quit. You blankety blank, 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 gutless coward. You're not coming home. So I sat in the phone booth and cried, and then I realized, as miserable as I was in my brief try with the Eagles, um, I was even more miserable on the outside looking in. So I said, I've got to try this one more time. I, 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 I definitely want to play. So I spent the rest of that year in the Chicago Owls uh, of the Continental League. You know, we practiced a couple times a week and uh, played in Chicago's Soldier's Field. There were the wives and maybe the children and the mom or dad. So maybe there were a um, hundred people in the stands, literally, in a 120,000-seat stadium. But it was fun. It was a stepping stone to keep me active playing with a plan of making the NFL the following year. So I studied which teams needed offensive guards. Uh, I decided on signing with the Miami Dolphins, this silly new Howard Johnson colored team in Miami, basically because Ed Tuck, who played at Notre Dame, was my backup at Notre Dame, had gone to the Miami Dolphins and made their team. So in the end, I said, you know what, if I can't beat out Ed Tuck, I can't play. <laughs>
Kuchenberg, a guard who came off uh, the sand lots and has done an excellent job for us. He uh, had to win a place on our football team. He did that. And then he had to win a number one starting position. He did that. And he's been playing some steady football for us. It's getting to the point where it's very enjoyable, very fun to know that very likely you're going to go out there and kick somebody's butt. Hands off. Kick through the middle. If you let Larry and, and Jim and myself do what we're supposed to do, there's not a whole lot you can do to stop that. After their loss in week two, the Dolphins ran off 10 consecutive wins. Their average margin of victory was 17 points. They were the best team in football and they were getting better every week. In 1973, O.J. Simpson became the first NFL player to rush for 2,000 yards in the season. Dick Anderson in the Miami defense made him earn it. O.J. gained 813 yards in Buffalo's first five games, but in week six, the Dolphins held him to a season-low 55 yards. the Bills and Dolphins met again in Buffalo. O.J.'s pursuit of history had become the focus of the Bills season, and they kept giving him the ball, even though they were 17 points down in the fourth quarter. Late in the game, both Nick Bonacani and Manny Fernandez got fairly vocal with the Bills, telling them, what's wrong with you guys? Why do you keep giving it to O.J.? You know, try to win the game. The fact that Juice was trying to get 2,000 yards uh, and the team was trying to help him get 2,000 yards but not a victory was consistent with who they were. This is a team that placed a greater emphasis on an individual record and an individual than they did on the team. It was quite opposite what we were all about. The Dolphins were about just one thing, and that was winning. Their stars, such as quarterback Bob Greasy and wide receiver Paul Warfield, number 42, put the team first. In the 1973 season, Greasy and Warfield connected on just 29 passes, but 11 went for touchdowns. Warfield combined the speed of an Olympic sprinter and the balance of a Bolshoi dancer. In five seasons with the Dolphins, Warfield averaged 21 yards per reception, a franchise record. I never saw a guy who had as much grace and beauty and just agility uh, as, as a pass catcher. And the greatest move I've ever seen was Paul Warfield against Oakland, and he just did a pirouette with just the grace and smoothness of a gazelle and just kept on down the field. And it was something I can see in my mind right now because I've never seen a move like that, even by me. Uh, we're on top of the division, and uh, that's all we're concerned with. And uh, all we, all we want to do is get a winning streak going. And the quarterback should uh, be happy with the team performance and not with individual performances. Bob was not a guy who had to pad his statistics he was about winning if we'd have traded Bob Greasy to the Jets in the early 70s in exchange for Joe Namath we wouldn't have broken 500 because Joe would have been making the sky dark with footballs instead of handing it off to uh, Zonka kick and and Mercury behind Little and Langer and Bob in New York if he'd have had to throw the ball 40 times his arm would have fallen off probably <laughs> Bob Greasy went about his business uh, as a business. And I think that really is the way our entire team handled their, their life. The Dolphins were the reigning kings of pro football, but they lived a working man's existence. My first salary was $15,000. My second one was seventeen five. My third one was twenty-one. You know, that wasn't a lot of money, and, and we knew that we weren't going to get the big raises, so we really had to work in the off-season if we wanted to get ahead. Manny Fernandez was a carpenter at $5 an hour. Larry Little uh, was a, a substitute teacher. Uh, Nick Bonacani had gotten his law degree when he was with New England. He studied for the bar, passed the Florida bar, and practiced in a law firm. 
I'd sold insurance to banks and financial institutions. Uh, anything extra that we made in the Super Bowl, I put into real estate. So I was very fortunate that uh, I was actually doing better in my business than I was playing football. Yeah, Dick was a business hustler. He dominated the, the one payphone we had in the locker room, and he was always doing business. Believe it or not, I had a car phone in 1972. In the trunk, you know, the box is about three feet long and about a foot wide and about six inches deep that you put in your, your trunk. And uh, in the early days, to get a line, you had to push a button until it got green, and then you'd dial the phone. And so um, I'd go out in my car at uh, lunchtime and, and make phone calls uh, from my car phone. Dick Anderson was all business on the field as well. He was a football and academic All-American at the University of Colorado. His combination of intensity and intelligence epitomized a Miami defense that allowed the fewest points in the NFL in the 1973 season. Dick Anderson, a strong side safety, strong. Uh, he's now going into the third year of our system. He has a real good understanding of the zones and what we want done. And he's a good tackler. He comes up and hits, and then he's a big play man. He has the time and he battles one of them. Intercepted by Dick Anderson. When the Dolphins won their first AFC title, the defense was called the No Names. But by 1973, that was changing. Nick Bonacani, number 85, was building a Hall of Fame resume at linebacker. Bill Stanfield, number 84, was recognized as one of the game's top defensive ends. And calling the shots was a gruff, chain-smoking defensive coordinator named Bill Armsparger. Shula would yell at everybody, but he wouldn't yell at Bill. Bill just look at him, kind of shake his head, and walk away. And they had a relationship that went all the way back to the assistant coaches at Kentucky with Blanton Collier. And so their history went back a long way. Now, the thing they're hitting, come here, the thing they're hitting. Arnsparger created the 53 defense, named after Bob Matheson, number 53. Arnsparger kept opponents guessing by using Matheson as a combination linebacker and defensive end. His ability to blitz helped the Dolphins lead the NFL in sacks. Even when he didn't reach the quarterback, his pressure forced hurried passes and interceptions. At the end of the regular season, we'd only had 150 points scored against us. Five passing touchdowns was all that our defense allowed. And I think it proves that, you know, the 73 team, even though we lost two games, was probably a better overall team than the 72 team. Dick Anderson led the league with eight interceptions in 1973 and he was named Defensive Player of the Year. In week 12, with the division title clinched, the Dolphins met Pittsburgh in the Orange Bowl. Anderson turned the Monday night game into a personal showcase. He set a team record by intercepting four passes and returned two of them for touchdowns. It was just one of those special nights that, you know, it was just fun. You know, football's supposed to be fun, but it's work most of the time. But in that particular game, I think it's the only time in my career that I can remember coming off the field just smiling and laughing and saying, gee, this is kind of neat. I can remember Joe Jacoby walking up to me, Doug Williams, he say, black, red, green, and yellow, you our quarterback. NFL Network presents America's Game. The Miami Dolphins won their Week 12 game against Pittsburgh, but they paid a price. Mercury Mars suffered a cracked vertebrae in his neck when he was slammed headfirst into the artificial turf. Usually a reaction for, you know, a, a big uh, healthy football players and the, the guys come off on the sideline and say, well, coach, I, uh, I think I broke my collarbone and I think my shoulder separated. I came off this, I was screaming, ah, ah, I ran off the field. I mean, I sprinted off the field and I ran and I hit the sideline and I, <laughs> I went under the bench and I was up like this, ah, 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 like a dog had been hit by a car. And I'm underneath the bench and the doctor says, Eugene, 
if you don't come out from underneath the bench, I, I can't help you. And so Shula's going, come out from underneath there. And so I said, my neck is my back is my shoulder. I didn't know what it was. I was just scared to death. And so um, I, I came out that game, and I, I didn't play anymore. Morris's injury was first thought to be just a pinched nerve, so he was cleared to play the following week in Baltimore. At 12-1, and one, the Dolphins were just playing out the regular season, so losing a game to the last place Colts wasn't a concern. What was a concern was the number of players who went down with injuries. Among them was Bob Kuchenberg, who suffered a broken arm. I told the doc, you're going to get me ready to play. I'm not, you know, I'm not going to play next week, but I'm playing in the playoffs two weeks from now. So I don't care how you do it. It's not my business, but I'm just telling you, do what you got to do because I'm playing. And what they did was uh, take a, um, a drill and go in my wrist and uh, hollowed out the bone marrow from the wrist up to the elbow, almost just short of the elbow. And then they drove a rod into the uh, hollowed out bone marrow with a hook at the end of the rod by the wrist. And uh, they put a cast on that, but um, that's a small price you pay to be able to, to uh, continue your dream of getting back to the Super Bowl. The Dolphins opened the postseason against Cincinnati. But after taking a 21-3 lead, the defending champion stumbled. Neil Craig's touchdown was followed by a Cincinnati field goal. On the ensuing kickoff, the ball bounced away from Mercury Mars, and the Dolphins could see the game and their season slipping away. The Bengals turned that fumble into a field goal, cutting the Miami lead to five points at halftime. Shula was furious, furious at halftime. Uh, he was screaming and yelling and, and uh, you know, couldn't believe it. And, and you know, I think our um, emotion was one of fear. You know, the fear we, we could lose this game. If we made mistakes and he was irate about the mistakes, playing poorly is one thing. Another guy plays better than you, it's another. But making mistakes that are costly was something that he didn't stand for. We needed to get back and do what we were supposed to do in the second half. The Dolphins regained control of the game in the third quarter. Dick Anderson's interception set up a scoring drive that culminated with a Bob Greasy touchdown pass to tight end Jim Mandich. The following week in the AFC Championship game, the Dolphins avenged their regular season loss to Oakland. They rolled up 292 yards against the league's top-ranked rushing defense. Greasy threw just six passes in the entire game as the Dolphins earned their third consecutive trip to the Super Bowl. We will put on the line one bag of oranges and all the suntan lotion that you can use before March the 1st. Now, we feel that about the only thing that, of course, that you could reciprocate with is a bag of snow, if that's agreeable to you. When Miami's civic leaders made their friendly wager with their counterparts in Minnesota, they did not know that for the third consecutive year, Sports Illustrated would predict a Miami loss in the Super Bowl. None of that crap matters. None of that mattered. That's somebody else saying something about what we had to do. We were already idyllic about taking ourselves away from the perspective in Super Bowl VI. When we were walking around New Orleans going, gee, we're in the Super Bowl. And the next thing you know, gee, we're getting our ass kicked in the Super Bowl. Ever since then, we knew that our focus had to be on our job, what we were there to do. The Dolphins won the toss. The Dolphins are going to receive the ball to start the game. They've lost only one toss all year long. 
in the playoffs of 1973, all three coin tosses we won, and we received all three times. And all three games, we methodically went down and scored touchdowns. Breezy takes the snap. It's Zonka straight up the middle, and he's got the It's been all Miami. All Larry Zunko. That's right. When you look at the films, you can see guys came with me on a fake. They know I didn't have the ball, but they didn't want to have to tackle Zonka because Zonka was on a roll in that game, and there was no way that they could stop us. They could not stop the machine that we brought there. And off Zonka, he's got it in himself. And Zonka picks up another 13 yards. The Dolphins had success running at the Vikings all-pro tackle Alan Page. That's because Bob Kuchenberg, playing with his broken left arm in a cast, dominated and frustrated his former Notre Dame teammate. Kuchenberg was blocking him for two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten seconds, which is a long time if you're still after a guy and the play's all the way over the other side of the field and Cooch is still trying to roll up on Page and Page is getting frustrated because Kuchenberg did his job so well and I remember when Page swung at him and it was out of Kuchenberg's tenacity of continuing as he's supposed to block him all the way down the field until the play stops. Allen actually got thrown out of the game. 15-yard penalty and ejected. Uh, and that was the, uh, the end of a very frustrating day for, for him. Miami dismantled a Viking defense that had allowed the fewest points in the NFC. Really, it's a good feeling. You know, when you don't have to play and watch the offense go down the field, because sooner or later, we were going to have to play. The swarming Miami defense shut down quarterback Fran Tarkenton and smothered the Vikings' attack. On offense, the Dolphins stayed with the game plan that won for them all season. Bob Greasy threw only seven passes, but he completed six of them. It is hot! Force your pop the ball while getting down a 27-yard pass plan, an amazing catch by Warfield. Larry Zonka was the game's most valuable player, rushing for 145 yards and scoring two touchdowns. Now he hands off to Zonka, heading right side, touchdown, Larry Zonka! His second touchdown of the afternoon. And the Dolphins, if they haven't already, have now established clear superiority in this game. With the victory and the championship assured, Shula paid tribute to several veterans by allowing them a curtain call. One of the great honors in my career was uh, at the end of Super Bowl VIII, Coach Shula called a few of us off I went toward the bench and Don Shula came over and gave me a big hug. That was the perfect ending to a, a nearly perfect day. And uh, seems like it was yesterday. <laughs> After the game, Shula and owner Joe Robbie basked in the glow of their second world championship. The question is, do I think my team is better than it was a year ago? There's no question about it. I think that we're a better football team than we were a year ago at this time. I think that we've gone one step beyond last year. Mercury Morris used to be a name in professional football, but now he's a defendant in a drug case. Friday, a jury in Miami will decide whether Mercury Morris became a cocaine dealer. Mercury Morris was arrested at his Miami home in 1982 and charged with conspiracy to distribute cocaine. His life had been in a downward spiral from the time his football career ended in 1977. I, I had a drug problem at that time. Uh, I'm a frequent drug problem, not a habitual drug problem, but a frequent one. Were you a user of cocaine? Yes. It had gotten to the point where uh, I, f I felt that uh, there was nothing I could, I could really do to, to alleviate this situation and destroy my life. Sorry. We have a break down. 
Morris was found guilty on three counts of drug trafficking. The former Dolphin star was sentenced to the Dade County Jail, which is located in sight of the Orange Bowl. Morris was close enough to hear the cheers on game day. It was particularly painful when the Dolphins celebrated the 10th anniversary of their perfect season. Where do you live in, Jimmy? I live here in Fort Lauderdale. You live in Fort Lauderdale? Yeah. While Morris's teammates were reunited on the field, he was listening to the ceremony from his jail cell. It's a real privilege for me to introduce to you a man successful in business, a Florida State Center, strong safety, Dick Anderson. I could hear the cheering from the jail, and I remember a guy coming up to me and saying, Hey, Merck, man, hey, you know, they, don't you know, they got on the radio, they're playing, uh, they're playing the Dolphins, man, they mention everybody's name but yours. I said, well, then, they didn't mention everybody's name, then, did they? A tremendous receiver, a great blocker, Jim Mandage. It, it came to pass that day when I was lamenting about what my circumstance was, the idea that, well... This is what you've gotten yourself into, my friend, and this is what you're going to have to get yourself out of. And there's no way that you're going to be over there. And it really gave me a chance to look in perspective at the choices that I had made in my life that eventually led me to where I was right there. A future Hall of Famer, good receiver, Paul Warfield. One of the most important things that happened during that time is that Paul came to see me. And... Even to this second, right, right this moment, uh, <laughs> even though it was that long ago, uh, the, the respect and the love that I have for this guy, because he didn't want to come there. He, nobody wanted to be associated with me because I had gotten busted on this drug charge. And uh, he came to see me. And it was such a lift for me that it made me feel uh, that I, I still was part of that, of that circumstance. Ladies and gentlemen, a standing ovation for the greatest football team ever put together. Mars was released from prison in 1985 after serving three and a half years. Reunited with his wife and daughter, he said he was a wiser and better man. In any crisis, there's always uh, two avenues to travel. One is uh, complete destruction, and the other is to uh, totally revive yourself. And that's, those are the options I had, and I chose the latter. Margaret, I was a star running back on a Super Bowl team with a perfect record. I'm Mercury Morris with the NFL alumni. For a time in my life, I went the wrong way. Morris became a spokesman in Florida's war against drugs. He shared his story with thousands of people hoping to make as big an impact in the game of life as he once did in the game of football. I'm happy that things turned out the way they did in my life, and I'm thankful as I look back for every single circumstance that I've gone through because it's enabled me to learn something uh, about myself and, and about what teammates are and about who people are. So we're a close-knit group because of the great times and because of the adversities that we've gone through together. Eugene has grown immensely in the years since we were playing together. He said, when you get your American Express bill a month from now, you know? <laughs> <laughs> he made some mistakes that a lot of young people make. And, um, and he got caught, and he got in trouble for it, and he paid the price for it. Oh. <laughs> I really enjoy my relationship with uh, Eugene Morris nowadays. You gotta hang out the ball. <laughs> and he's a pleasure to be with. Very bright fellow, very articulate, and uh, just a lot of fun. Yeah. Hey, don't blow the skate. <laughs> <laughs> don't blow the skate. Yeah. <laughs> Did you notice that? Are you sure? No, I don't listen to you when you talk. No, I don't. <laughs> Told well, obviously he did. We had great togetherness. That really is the way our entire team handled their life. Pick this up, rub it for luck. We're rubbing that for luck for money. All right. We had interesting characters on our team, but when it came to the field and it came to preparation, we were very, very focused on doing things right.
Going into 73, I think the business-like approach, the focus, but more importantly, the pride that we had that we were good enough to keep winning is what uh, drove us to that success. The Miami Dolphins are the champions of the pro football world. They have won the Super Bowl for the second time running. Only the second team ever to do that. You know, we were part of history at the time, and we're certainly still part of history. I can look back and, and say there was a great deal of love then and now for all those guys that I played with. Additional video content, photo galleries, and more from America's Game, visit NFL.com slash America's Game.